ان الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان استقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار the topic that we're discussing today is we're going to look at some trials and some lessons from Surah Al-Kaf and we're going to examine the link between this great surah and the trials of Al-Masih Al-Dajjal, the Dajjal. Now we recite this surah every single Friday. Most of us probably don't know some of the great lessons that are within this surah. We probably don't know the, the true treasures that are within this surah. We probably don't know how applicable this surah actually is to our day-to-day -day lives. And inshallah today I'm going to mention six main trials from this surah. Six main lessons from this surah. And then we're going to link those with the trials of Dajjal. Before we begin, I just want to mention some of the virtues of reciting Surah Al-Kaf. Some of the virtues of reciting Surah Al-Kaf on a Friday, just to encourage you brothers and sisters to uphold this sunnah and to spread it as well. It's narrated from Abu Sa'id Al-Khudri radiallahu an that he said, whoever recites Surah Al-Kaf on the night of Jumu'ah, he will have a light that will stretch between him and the ancient house, i.e. a light will stretch from him to al kaaba now, this is a marfu hadith, it goes back to Abi, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. But the companions would never speak about an aspect of the unseen unless they heard it directly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So although this narration goes back to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, the scholars have said it's the same as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam saying it because the companions would never speak of something without knowledge. So this goes back and it's the same as the Prophet ﷺ saying it. So whoever recites Surah Al-Kaf on the night of Al-Jumu'ah, he will have a light that will stretch from him to Al-Kaaba. And it's also narrated that whoever reads Surah Al-Kaf on the day of Jumu'ah, he will have a light that will shine from him from one Friday until the next. And it's narrated from Ibn Umar radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, whoever reads Surah Kaf on the day of Jumu'ah, a light will shine from him from beneath his feet to the clouds of the sky, which will shine for him on the day of resurrection. And he will be forgiven his sins between the two Fridays. So from this Friday to the previous Friday, you'll be forgiven your sins. Such are the great blessings and the great reward of reciting Surah Al-Kaf. This is just reciting it. Now what I want to do today, as I've mentioned, is examine this link between this great surah and the Dajjal. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, whoever commits 10 verses from the beginning of Surah Al-Kaf to his memory that he will be protected from the trials of the Dajjal. Now the question is, What's the link between this surah and the Dajjal? Dajjal is not mentioned in a single place in this surah. There is no mention of Masih al-Dajjal in this surah in a single place. So what is the link? What's the link between this surah and the Dajjal? So as I mentioned, six, le six uh, lessons, six trials that we as Muslims, we may go through in our day-to-day -day lives. So the Muslim, when he reads this surah, Insha'Allah, you brothers and sisters, you're going to go away now after this uh, dars and you're going to be able to recognize these trials. So whenever you read each one of these parts of the surah, you're going to understand there is a wisdom behind this. The first trial that we as Muslims living in the 21st century and in fact until Yawm al-Qiyamah, we as Muslims may face is this trial of holding on to our deen in times of oppression, in times of tyranny. 
So holding on to our religion, we want to practice our religion. But as a result of that, we are oppressed. As a result of that, we are going to be attacked. As a result of that, it's like holding on to a hot coal, as the Prophet ﷺ, he said. So when a Muslim, he wants to become practicing, perhaps the brother wants to grow his beard, perhaps he wants to go further into Islam, he may face difficulties from his own family. His own family may give him difficulties. Perhaps he wants to follow the path of Tawheed. His family are Sufis. His family are engaged in shirk and innovation. They may oppress the brother. Perhaps the sister wants to wear hijab. Perhaps the sister wants to wear the niqab or the jilbab. As a result of that, her family say, you know, you don't need to wear this. So she faces difficulties from within her own family. Perhaps the wider community. Look what's happening in Syria today. Those people, they are only being attacked because they say, our Lord is Allah. Because they don't worship Al-Bashar. They don't worship him, so they are being attacked. They are being oppressed as a result of holding on to their religion. So when the Muslim comes to the part of the surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the trials of the people of the cave. The people of the cave, they were young men who their entire village or their entire town was worshipping others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These young men, they stood up and they said, we are not going to associate partners with Allah. They held on to their religion. They stood up for tawheed. They stood up against shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَى Indeed, it is we who relate to you this story in truth indeed they were young men who believed in their lord so we increased them in guidance and what did these young men say وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ إِذْ قَامُوا فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَنْ نَدْعُوَ مِنْ دُونِهِ إِلَاهًا لَقَدْ قُلْنَا إِذَا شَطَطًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we made their hearts firm when they stood up so these people their whole nation was worshipping others besides Allah these young men they stood up and they said رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ our Lord he is the Lord of the heavens and of the earth never are we going to call upon somebody else besides Allah if we did this we would have indeed spoken a, a great transgression a great evil so subhanallah look at these young men they stood up for tawheed they held on to their religion in times of oppression and as a result of that they had to leave their people they had to go to the cave and they remained in the cave as a result of that so they stood up for tawheed so when the Muslim he reads this. When the Muslim reads this incident in this surah, he understands if I am being oppressed, if I am facing difficulties as a result of holding on to my deen, then everybody in the past who did something similar, they were also oppressed. The Prophet ﷺ, he was beaten. The Quraysh, the pagans of Quraysh tried to kill him. They beat Abu Bakr radiallahu an until he nearly died. They took Bilal radiallahu an into the desert and they outstretched him wide in the scorching heat and they placed a big rock on his stomach and they told him to denounce his God and to announce that he was worshipping what they were upon. But he kept saying, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad, that Allah is one, He is one. Look at this, these people, they were oppressed. And this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you stand up for tawheed, you stand up for sunnah, you are going to face oppression. One of the companions, the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. He says, we complained to the messenger of Allah whilst he was lying under the Kaaba, under the shade of the Kaaba, and his, his, like, his thobe or his robe, it, he was using it as a pillow. And they said, why don't you supplicate to Allah for us? Why don't you make dua for us? Why don't you ask Allah for his aid? So the Prophet ﷺ replied, Amongst those people who came before you, there was a man who was taken, he was seized, and he was put in a hole that was dug specifically for him. Then a saw was bought, and he was cut in half from his head down to his, uh, between his legs. He was cut in half. Then he was raked with metal teeth. 
So imagine you have uh, like a, a garden rake which is, has metal teeth, very sharp metal teeth. The Prophet ﷺ said he was raked with metal teeth through his flesh and bones. So his flesh and his bones were ripped apart and the Prophet ﷺ said none of that turned him from his religion. None of that turned him from his religion. He was still firm upon his religion. So this is the first trial that me and you we may go through in our lives. Oppression as a result of holding on to our deen. Oppression as a result of holding on to our deen. And when we read this, then subhanallah, we understand that look, these young men, they are being honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they stood up and they didn't commit shirk. So if I too hold on to my religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to honor me. Allah says, وَزِدْنَاهُمْ huda." We increase them in guidance. So if the Muslim, he is being oppressed or he's facing difficulties in holding on to his religion, he turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he reads this first trial. He has hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he reads this first trial. And it gives him patience and it gives him perseverance when he reads this first trial. So this is the first trial, Ikhwani, this trial of facing oppression and tyranny as a result of holding on to your religion. As for the second trial, then it is the trial of seeking to be associated with those who have wealth or those who have power. Some of the Quraysh, they came to the Prophet Wasallam and said, we don't want you to sit with the likes of Bilal. We don't want you to sit with the likes of these poor, weak companions. We will only sit with you if you denounce your companions. Those who are weak, we don't want to sit with them. We only want to be amongst the company of those who are rich, those who are powerful. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed this ayah. وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَا وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Keep yourself patient with those who call upon their Lord in the morning and in the evening seeking his face. Keep yourself with those people who are practicing. Keep yourself with Ahlul, uh, Ahlul uh, at tawheed the people of Tawheed. Keep yourself with those people who are going to be good for you. Don't look past them. Allah says, don't let your eyes overlook them seeking the desires of this world. And do not obey the one in whose heart he is heedless of our remembrance. And as a result of that, he follows his desires and his affairs are in a, a state of neglect. Ikhwani, when the Muslim, he reads this trial, he reads this ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the messenger of Allah to stay with those who are seeking the face of Allah. Stay with those who are working for their akhirah. The Muslim understands as well, this is a command for me. I shouldn't congregate around somebody just because he has wealth, just because he has status, just because he has power. Rather, I need to stick to the ones who are going to be good for my akhirah. The same way Allah commanded the Messenger salam, to stay with the likes of Bilal because they are seeking the face of Allah and they are the ones who call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Say that the truth is from your Lord. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ So whoever wishes, then let him believe. And whoever wishes, let him disbelieve. In other words, ikhwani, don't sell your religion to try and impress those people around you. Don't sell your religion to try and impress others, to try and seek wealth or status or be in the company of those who have wealth and status. Say to them, this is the truth from Allah. If you believe, it's for your own benefit. If you disbelieve, it's for your own destruction. We find today, unfortunately, you know, people want to be associated with those who have wealth, those who have status and fame. And the same thing applies with the scholars as well. Those people, they throw the names of the scholars around. And then, subhanallah, although the scholar is a man of sunnah, but subhanallah, they say, I studied with such and such a scholar, seeking fame, seeking power, seeking control. 
but they don't actually implement the teachings of that scholar. So they are not upon sunnah, they are not upon tawheed, they are not upon the correct manhaj of the salaf al salih, yet they will throw the names of scholars around. I studied with such and such, I studied with such and such, seeking to be associated with him. So this is a big problem. Perhaps at work, you are the minority, perhaps there's a lot of non-Muslims, perhaps there's a people who call themselves Muslims, but they are just like the Muslims. And so as a result of that, you feel like you are the odd one out. Ikhwani, this ayah, when the Muslim reads it every Friday, he understands, I'm not going to sell my religion. I'm not going to let go of my religion to try and please them. As Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, Al the Jews and the Christians will not be pleased with you until you leave your religion. So it doesn't matter what you do, they're not going to be pleased with you. Hold on to your religion, Ikhwani. So, like I mentioned, when the Muslim reads this ayah every single Friday, he understands that he needs to surround himself with the good people. He needs to surround himself with the practicing people. And obviously we can mention the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, which is in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, where he compares the good friend, the righteous friend, to the one who sells perfume, to the one who sells musk. If you go there, he's going to give you some. If not, you're going to buy some of him. And if that doesn't happen, you're going to leave with a fine smell. So go and sit with the good friend. Go and keep yourself with the good people. When you're in their company, they remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either they're going to give you some knowledge or they're going to ask you a question and you can share that knowledge with them and you're going to leave with your iman increased or at the very least, at least you don't stink of the stench of uh, sins when you leave them. And then the Prophet salam, he compared those people who are the uh, bad friends to the one who works with the, with the fire. It's going to burn your clothes. You're in his, in his uh, surroundings. He's going to invite you to sin. He's going to speak about haram things. Going to burn you. Going to burn your iman. Decrease your iman. At the very least, you're going to leave with a foul smell upon you. This is the second trial. So the first trial, holding on to your deen in times of oppression. The second trial, uh, seeking to be associated with those who are in power or fame or they have wealth. The third trial, Ikhwani, is the trial of wealth and children. So the Muslim, he may say, no, alhamdulillah, I'm not oppressed. I can practice my religion free from oppression. Alhamdulillah, I don't seek to be with those people solely for fame or fortune or authority. Perhaps you are going to fall into this third category, this third trial, which is the trial of wealth and children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Kaf, and I'm just paraphrasing to save a bit of time, two men. And Allah mentions about one man, we gave him two gardens. And these gardens, they had palm trees and the fruit was coming forth from these gardens. And Allah caused a river to flow in this garden as well, between the two gardens. The man, he went to his friend and he said, I'm better than you in money and I'm better than you in terms of children and power as well. And I don't think that I'm ever, the day of resurrection is ever going to come. But if it does come, I think I'm going to get better than what I have right now. So he's basically become arrogant. His wealth and his children have led him to disbelieve. I don't think Yawm al Qiyamah is ever going to come. But if it does, Allah is going to bless me with better than this. Allah is going to give me better than this. Ikhwani, what did his companions say? Look, reinforcing that good companion who always reminds you of Allah. He says, وَلَوْلَا إِذْ دَخَلْتَ جَنَّتَكَ قُلْتَ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ Why, when you entered into your garden, didn't you say, Masha Allah, this is from Allah, what Allah willed has happened. لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ There's no power or no might except with Allah. Why did you attribute your own success to yourself? Like this is what you deserve. Because there's people who work harder than you and they don't have what you have. There's people who are more talented than you and they don't have what you have. Never attribute your success to yourself. It's a blessing from Allah, but it's also a trial. Are you going to be thankful to Allah or are you going to say this is from myself? This man, his wealth and his children made him arrogant. He said, this is from myself. I don't believe that this is ever going to end. And if it does, Allah is going to give me better. 
What happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed his garden. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed his gardens. There was nothing left. As a result of his arrogance and ingratitude, Allah destroyed his gardens. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Al-Malu wal Banuna Zina Tul Hayatid Dunya. Wealth and children are just an adornment of this life. This wealth that you have is going to disappear. These children that you have, when you die, they're going to forget you and they're going to live their lives. Just an adornment of this dunya. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ الصَّالِحَاتُ خَيْرٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ ثَوَابًا وَخَيْرٌ amala. Wealth and children are just an adornment of this life. But the good deeds that last are better with Allah in terms of reward and better for hope. Wealth and children are going to leave you, but your good deeds are more better in the sight of Allah in terms of the reward that you're going to receive and also in terms of you having hope for this mercy and the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the Muslim, every single Friday, he reads this story of the, men who had, of the man who had two gardens, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed that because of his ingratitude. He remembers, my wealth. My wife, my children, everything is a test from Allah. I need to be grateful. It's not from me. This is a blessing which Allah has bestowed upon me, but it's also a test. Am I going to turn back to Allah? And he doesn't let that wealth and those children turn him away from the remembrance of Allah. So he uses them in beneficial ways as opposed to allowing them to take him away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first trial... The tr trial of oppression and tyranny when holding on to your religion. The second trial, seeking to be associated with those of power and fame and authority. The third trial, the trial of wealth and the trial of children. The fourth trial now is this trial of lineage. This trial of lineage. What's this trial of lineage, Ikhwani? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَفَسَقَ عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهِ أَفَتَتَّخِذُونَهُ وَذُرِّيَّتَهُ أَوْلِيَاءَ مِنْ دُونِي وَهُمْ لَكُمْ عَدُوا بِئْسَ لِلظَّالِمِينَ بَدَلَا and mention when we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam. And they all prostrated except for Iblis. He was from the jinn. Are you then going to take him and his descendants as allies over me? Are you going to take him and his children and his descendants as allies over Allah? Wretched it is for the wrongdoers as an exchange. What an evil exchange it is. In another place... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Iblis said, Oh Allah, you created me from fire and you created him from clay. So Iblis is basically saying, Oh Allah, I'm better than him. My origin is better than his origin. Don't we have it today, Ikhwani, where we have the Arabs are looking down on the non-Arabs. The blacks look down on the whites and the whites look down on the blacks. This racism. This is all from lineage. My upbringing, my lineage is more noble than your lineage. We have this whole thing of the caste system. The caste system. The brother comes to marry the sister. He is a good brother. He is, uh, you know, he is good character. He has good deen. He is a good brother for this sister. But they say no. Why? Because your caste is not the same as her caste. Or your caste is lower than her caste. Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look at your caste on Yawm al-Qiyamah? Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look at your lineage on Yawm al-Qiyamah? Wallahi, subha Wallahi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at that. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at your taqwa. Allah looks at your iman. Allah looks at your deeds. Allah looks at your adherence to the sunnah. Allah looks at your staying away from shirk and innovation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never ever look at your caste. So this Muslim, when he reads about how Iblis, he did not prostrate to Adam, he remembers I am not better than anybody simply because of my lineage. I am not better than anybody simply because I am white and he is black. Or I am Arab and he is non-Arab. Or I come from this tribe or he comes from that tribe. The Muslim understands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is better, 
and closer to Allah is the one who has the better good deeds and the correct aqidah and the correct iman and the correct tawheed and he's upright upon the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So ikhwani this is the fourth trial the trial of lineage and the fifth trial is this trial of knowledge now the trial of knowledge so maybe you're not oppressed and you can practice your religion maybe you don't like to associate with people simply because of their wealth or their honor or their power or their authority maybe you don't you're not suffering with this trial of uh, you know, uh, wealth and children, alhamdulillah, you understand that it's a, it's a blessing and also a test from Allah. Maybe you're not arrogant about your lineage. Maybe you don't fall into racism, which has nothing to do with Islam. Maybe now you will fall into this fifth category, which is the trial of knowledge. The trial of knowledge. And what is this? In, where is this in Surah Al-Kaf? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of Musa, Musa alayhi salam and Khidr. Musa alayhi salam and Khidr. So the Muslim, he reads this trial, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Khidr some knowledge that Musa alayhi salam didn't have. And Musa alayhi salam, he humbly asked Khidr if he could accompany him. And he said, inshallah, you'll find me of those who are patient. So the Muslim remembers about this knowledge now. Ikhwani, when we talk about knowledge, we have to talk about this knowledge which does not benefit. Because the Muslim, when he reads this trial of Musa and Khidr, he thinks, all of this knowledge that I have, all of these ahadith that I know, all of this of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that I know, am I implementing this knowledge? Am I implementing this knowledge? Or has my knowledge made me arrogant? Where I think that I know everything and it makes me haughty and I look down on people. And I reject the truth because I've become arrogant. I think I know and nobody else knows. Nobody knows more than me. Nobody knows better than me. Has your knowledge translated into action? Because if that knowledge hasn't made you a better person today, it's not going to save you from the fire tomorrow. Rather, it's going to be used against you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He resurrects you and He stands you up, Allah will ask you about that knowledge. That knowledge that you had, but you never acted upon it. That knowledge that you had, and it was like books which are laden onto a donkey. As Allah describes the Jews, those people, those Jews who received the scriptures, they are like a donkey laden with books. All of that knowledge on the back of that donkey. Does it benefit the donkey? No. It only weighs the donkey down. So is your knowledge like that? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa'. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from that knowledge which does not benefit. That knowledge which does not benefit. So the Muslim, he asks himself when he reads the story of Musa and Khidr, my knowledge is it benefiting me? My knowledge, has it translated into beneficial action? My knowledge, is it the correct knowledge or is it that knowledge which does not benefit? Also, Ikhwani, this story also shows the superiority of the people of knowledge. Musa alayhi salam, one of the greatest and mightiest messengers of Allah, he humbled himself before Khidr because he wanted to learn that knowledge which he had. And so the Muslim, he remembers, if I don't know something, he remembers the ayah of Allah, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So always refer your affairs back to the scholars of, Al of Al-Islam. So this is the fifth trial and the sixth trial that the Muslim, he may fall into. So we mentioned the first one, oppression when holding on to your religion. We mentioned the second one, seeking to be associated with those of wealth, those of power, fame, authority. That's the second trial. The third trial is the trial of wealth and children and women. The fourth trial is the trial of your lineage. The fifth trial is the trial of knowledge. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected you from all of these trials, then definitely you're going to be tried with this sixth and final trial. This is the trial of power and authority. Where is this in Surah Al-Kaf? It's in the story of Dhul Qarnayn. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, and they ask you about Dhul Qarnayn, say, I will tell you about him. I'll recite a report to you about him. Allah says, we established him on the earth and we gave him a means to everything. So he 
فَأَتْبَعَ سَبَابَ He followed a way. And then he reached the setting place of the sun. And he found certain things. And then a group of people, they were presented to Dhul Qarnayn. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْنَا يَا ذَا الْقَرْنَيْنِ إِمَّا أَن تُعَذِّبَ وَإِمَّا أَن تَتَّخِذَ فِيهِمْ حُسْنًا O ذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ If you wish, you can either punish them or you can treat them with goodness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave ذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ the authority now. ذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ It's up to you. If you want to punish these people, it's up to you. If you want to treat them with goodness, it's up to you. Look at the justice of ذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ He says, قَالَ مَنْ قَالَ أَمَّا مَنْ ظَلَمَ فَسَوْفَ نُعَذِّبُهُ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّ إِلَى رَبِّهِ فَيُعَذِّبُهُ عَذَابًا نُكْرًا He said, as for the one who wrongs, we are going to punish him. Then he's going to be returned to Allah and he's going to be punished with a terrible punishment. وَأَمَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُ جَزَاءَ الْحُسْنَى وَسَنَقُولُ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِنَا يُسْرًا But as for the one who believes and he does righteousness, he's going to have the reward of paradise and we are going to be easy on him with our command. Look at the justice of Dhul Qarnayn. The one who wrongs, the one who oppresses, we're going to punish him. As for the one who does goodness and he believes, then we're going to be gentle and we're going to speak goodness with him. And then Allah is going to reward him. The Muslim, he thinks about this now. Am I being just with those who are around me? The Prophet ﷺ said, each of you is a shepherd and he is responsible for his flock. So when the Muslim reads this, he thinks about his family. Am I just with my family? He thinks about with his work friends. He thinks about those people who he employs. Am I just with them? Because if I'm not, I'm going to have to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ikhwani, we've briefly mentioned six trials, which when the Muslim reads Surah Al-Kaf, every single week, he is reminded of these six trials. So he says to himself, Ya Abdullah, don't fall into these trials. Don't fall into the trial of, which is mentioned in the story of the young men of the cave. Don't let go of your religion. Stand up for your religion. Hold on to Tawheed. Hold on to the Sunnah of the Prophet salam, the way those young men did, the way they held on to Tawheed. He remembers about the trial of being patient and being associated with those who are seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he remembers and he asks himself about his friends. Are my friends practicing? Am I selling my religion for a small gain in the dunya? Am I selling my religion to try and please the people? So he holds on to his religion. The third trial, he remembers about the men and the one who he had two gardens, but his wealth turned him away from the remembrance of Allah. His wealth was a source of punishment for him. So he remembers now, Ya Abdullah, don't let your wealth turn you away from Allah. Don't seek and chase after this wealth and sell your akhirah as a result. He remembers how Iblis refused to prostrate because he said, I'm better than him. You created me from fire, you created him from clay. He remembers about his lineage and he remembers you are not better than anybody except through your taqwa and your iman and your aqidah and your fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he remembers the trials of Musa and Khidr and he asks himself, my knowledge, is it beneficial? My knowledge, is it translating into good actions. My knowledge, will it stand for me or against me on Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Then he remembers about Dhul Qarnayn and he remembers about being just, just with others and just when taking yourself to account as well. Many times we are just with others or we do our best to have justice with others. When it comes to our own taking account of our own selves, we are very lenient. We say, don't worry, Allah is Ghafoor Rahim, And shaitan, he begins to deceive us like this. So the Muslim, when he reads about Dhul Qarnayn and his justice, he is just with others and he is just with himself. Now, Ikhwani, in the last 10 minutes that we have left, I want to ask the question, what is the link with Dajjal? What's the link with all of these six trials and Dajjal? Why is this surah a protection from Dajjal? Why do we read it every Friday? And what's the link with Dajjal? Ikhwani, the answer is that each one of these six trials that I've mentioned to you is directly linked with the trials that Dajjal will come with. When Dajjal comes, 
each and every one of these trials that I've mentioned, the Muslim is going to face them. The first trial, which is holding on to your deen in times of oppression and tyranny. When the Dajjal, he emerges and the Muslims don't believe in him, they are going to face a great deal of oppression. They are going to face a great deal of difficulty. The Prophet wasallam he mentioned, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Then he's going to come, referring to Dajjal, he's going to come to another people. And he's going to call them to his false religion. But they will reject his call. He will depart from them and they will suffer famine and will possess nothing in the form of wealth. So because they disbelieved in Dajjal and they believed in Allah, when he leaves, a great famine is going to fall on those people. They're not going to have any food or any wealth. There is going to be nothing until in some narrations they are going to be surviving on the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the bull, the head of the bull, the skull of the bull, which has no meat on it, is going to become extremely valuable. Then we have this oppression of that young man who is going to exit Medina. He's going to leave Medina and he's from the best of the people. And he's going to say to Dajjal, I recognize you. You are the one who the Prophet ﷺ warned the people against. And then the Dajjal is going to say to the people who are with him, Look, if I kill this man and then I give him life, will you have any doubt about my claim? They will say no. Then the Dajjal will kill that man and will make him alive. Look, simply because he didn't believe in the Dajjal, the Dajjal is going to kill him. The Dajjal is going to kill him simply because he didn't believe in him. Look at this tyranny, look at this oppression. So Ikhwani, when the Muslim reads this first trial, the trial of the men, he understands about his own oppression, his own tyranny, his own difficulties, but he also links it to the difficulties that will come when the Dajjal, he emerges. The ones who don't follow him and they hold on to his religion, they are going to face immense difficulties, immense oppression. What was the second trial we mentioned? Wanting to be associated with those who have power, those who have authority. Ikhwani, what about when Dajjal he comes and the vast majority of people follow him? What about when he can travel across the earth like a fast wind? What about when he has he points to the, tre to the earth and it brings out its treasures? What about when he points to the sky and it rains by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Isn't this going to be difficult when everybody is following him and everybody wants to be associated with Dajjal? Isn't it going to be difficult to keep yourself back? Isn't it going to be difficult on that day to be from the Muslims? Until a man is going to come and he's going to come home and he's going to tie up his wife and his women folk and his mother and his aunties so that they don't go out and follow the Dajjal. The Prophet wasallam said he will come to the people and invite them to a wrong religion, i.e. to his kufr, to, his, to, to believe in him, to the shirk. They will affirm their faith, they're going to believe in him and they're going to respond to him. He will then give a command to the sky, there will be rainfall upon the earth and it will grow crops. Then in the evening, the animals will come to them with their humps full, full of uh, milk and their flanks are big, i.e. The, the animals have grown really big. So subhanallah. This is from the Dajjal. Aren't you going to want to be associated with him? Aren't you going to want some of that power? Aren't you going to want some of that authority? So it's going to be extremely difficult, Ya Ikhwan, when Dajjal emerges, people are going to want to be associated with him. The third trial is the trial of wealth and children. Dajjal is going to have all of these treasures and he's going to say to his people, follow me and I will give you these treasures. When he points to the earth and it brings forth its treasures and the gold and the silver and the gems, aren't you or isn't the person who only wants wealth, he's going to be very tempted to follow Dajjal because he wants some of that wealth. He wants some of that wealth. So again, Ikhwani, when the Muslim, he reads about the trial of the man who had two gardens, he thinks about his own situation, but he also likens it to when the Dajjal emerges and he's going to say, I don't need that wealth, I don't need those treasures, when the Dajjal, he emerges. The fourth trial is the trial of lineage. We mentioned the trial of lineage. We are extremely proud. My parents are from this village. My parents are from that caste. My parents, etc. What about when the Dajjal comes to a man? What about when the Dajjal comes to a man? 
and his parents have died and he says, if I bring your parents back, will you believe in me? And then two shayateen, they take the form of his mother and his father and they say, he is your Lord, believe in him. Isn't that something to do with your lineage? Where your own parents are telling you to follow Dajjal. The greatest part of your lineage, though your mother and your father, they come back to life seemingly. They haven't really. Only Allah can bring somebody back to life. But these are two shayateen who take the form of your mother and father and they will say, believe in him. A great trial of lineage. A great trial of lineage. And the fifth trial, ikhwani, the trial of knowledge. When Dajjal, he knows where the earth's treasures are by the permission of Allah. And he's going to offer this knowledge to his followers. I know where this is. So they think that look at the great knowledge of Dajjal. He has knowledge of where the earth's treasures lie. He has knowledge of where and when it will rain. So subhanallah, this trial of knowledge. So the Muslim, he reads about lineage and he thinks, you know what? There is no obedience to the creation if it means the disobedience to the creator. I'm not going to obey my mother and father if they ask, ask me to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the trial of lineage, he won't follow Dajjal. And as for the trial of knowledge, he says all of this knowledge is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's not going to follow the Dajjal. As for the sixth and final uh, trial, the trial of power, the trial of authority. Ikhwani, imagine Dajjal comes and he has so much or so much land and so many countries under his belt. He is ruling them all. And he says, if you follow me, I will give you some of this power. If you follow me, I will give you some of these countries. Look at the difficulty in this Muslim now. Look at the difficulty that the people will face. So Ikhwani, we are fast running out of time. But subhanAllah, each one of these trials, each one of these trials... The Muslim, he links it back to himself first. And then he links it to the trials of Dajjal. This is how the Surah Al-Kaf, it prepares you as a Muslim. From one week to the next, when you read it, it gives you a one week refresher. It's like somebody's pressed refresh on these reminders, these trials that you may go through. And then you read it again and it refreshes your memory. And again, it prepares you for the trial of the Dajjal. So in uh, conclusion... This trial of standing up for your deen. This trial of wanting to be associated with those in power, those who have knowledge, those who have wealth. The trial of wealth and children. The trial of your lineage. The trial of knowledge. And the trial of power and authority and responsibility. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from these six trials. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a tawfiq to reflect and ponder over the verses of the Quran. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the trials of the Dajjal and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep our families and our children safe from shirk and, uh, and, and innovation and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of tawheed ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk Jazakallah khairan, Brother Hussain. May Allah reward you for this effort. I mean, uh, we don't have much time left, so if anybody wants to ask a question related to the topic, inshallah, Brother Hussain will try to inshallah answer that. Jazakallah khairan. Ji. There's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars as to, uh, firstly, Khidr is definitely not an angel. There's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars as to whether he is an, uh, a prophet or whether he's not. There's a, uh, there's a difference of opinion. So that's something for you to look into, uh, inshallah. But it's, it is mentioned that Khidr, he is, he is mentioned and he is mentioned by name, but it's not mentioned, is he a prophet or is he not? But it seems, and the stronger opinion Allah knows best, is that he is uh, a prophet and this is because those things which he knew you know those things which were being revealed to him a man who is not being revealed to would not not know this type of thing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions we gave him knowledge a slave of ours who we blessed with this knowledge so it seems Allah knows best that Khidr he was a prophet 
But again, there's difference of opinion. So we can't say with a surety because we don't have a concrete proof. Uh, Allah knows best. Okay, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they are a creation, they are from the signs of the hour. They are a, from one of the major signs of the hour. So, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, on his travels, Dhul Qarnayn, he came across a people. And they said, oh Dhul Qarnayn, they, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they are spreading fitna and fasad in the land. So if we give you some money, will you build for us and them a wall? build a wall for us to protect us because they're coming and they're killing and they're spreading fitna and fasad in the land. Dhul Qarnayn said, what Allah has blessed me with is better than what you're going to give me. I don't need your money, but aid me with men and building tools. What I'll do, I'll build between you and them a dam. Okay, so this, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this dam still stands today. Our aqidah is that it's, they are around right now. Okay, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us that every day they try to break down the wall and they get to a certain distance or a certain amount and then they say, let's stop now and we'll come back tomorrow and we'll finish off the work. But when they come back the next day, the wall has been rebuilt. The wall has reached its previous height. Okay, one day in Medina, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was night time and he became startled. He said, Subhanallah, the amount of fitna that's, that's taken place on this night. So he sent somebody to wake up his wives. And he said that a hole this big has been made in the wall of, of Ya'ju, by Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So they are around right now. Okay? But when they come out, we've mentioned that they're going to say, we'll come back tomorrow. And then when they come back, the wall has been rebuilt. This is from the miracles of Allah. This is from the unseen. So we have to believe it. We affirm what the Prophet ﷺ has told us. But when they come out, they're going to say, we will come back tomorrow, inshaAllah. When they say, inshaAllah, the next day that they come back, the wall has not been rebuilt. And they will finish off the job and then they're going to sweep across the land. Dajjal, when he emerges, all of this fitna, this facade is going to take place. Then Isa alayhi salam, he is going to descend. We're turning into a whole other talk now. But Isa alayhi salam, he is going to descend. Wherever he looks and his breath is going to reach as far as his eye can see. Whoever of the followers of Dajjal he sees, they're going to uh, die. Isa alayhi salam is the one who's going to kill Dajjal. Okay? So when... Isa alayhi salam sees Dajjal, Dajjal is going to melt, you know like the way salt dissolves in water, this is the way Dajjal is going to melt. But Isa alayhi salam is going to take a spear and he's going to kill Dajjal, so that people know that he's been killed, he hasn't just disappeared and he's going to come back, he's died, he is not Allah. Then Allah will reveal to Isa alayhi salam, I have sent upon this earth things that you cannot deal with. Then Isa alayhi salam and the Muslims, they are going to go and stay in a fort, in a, in a, in a fortified position. Ya'juj and Ma'juj, out of their ignorance, they're going to say, we have killed everybody in the dunya. Now we're going to kill the people of the, of, of the heavens. They're going to push their arrows up and they're going to fire the arrows up into the sky. The arrows are going to come back with blood on the arrows. They're going to say, now we've killed everyone in the heavens as well. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send on them a disease like a worm in their neck. And they're all going to die. They're all going to die. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send camel, uh, sorry, big birds with the necks like camels. And they're going to take away the, uh, the bodies of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And the animals are going to eat also from the bodies of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And then Allah is going to send a rain, which is going to make, as the Prophet ﷺ said, the earth is going to be clean like a mirror. It's not going to leave any of their blood or any of their filth or any of their traces around. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they are one of the signs of the hour. They are around right now. Where are they? We don't know. Just like if somebody was to say to you, where is the throne of Iblis? We know it's in the water, on water, but we don't know where it is. Where is Dajjal? He's around right now, but we don't know where he is. He's going to emerge 
Allah knows best where he is. Where is Ya'juj and Ma'juj? We don't know. Some people have said they're a tribe in China and they're this and they're this. This is speaking without knowledge. This is going past where Allah and his messenger have taken us. So we stick to the, uh, to the narrations. And there's this man, uh, uh, Tariq Suwaydan, he does stories of the prophets. He's the one who said that, according to my research, they are uh, a tribe in some area of China. This is a load of rubbish. We reject this. We say, where did you get this from in the hadith? We stick to where Allah and his messenger uh, stopped. Allah knows best. Okay. Well, I think Pilar's got a question. I haven't come across anything except the fact that the Prophet ﷺ, he said there's no uh, trial since the creation of Adam greater than the trial of, uh, of the Dajjal. And it's enough for us to know that he's going to call people to worship others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's enough for us to know that upon his head is written kafir. It's enough for us to know that he is a, a trial. And it's enough for us to know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if he's around while I'm around, I'll take care of him. If not, then each man should deal with himself. So although we don't have anything directly, but uh, subhanallah, uh, the, the evidences and the proofs all point to the fact you know, that he's the greatest trial since the creation of Adam alayhi salam. Last question, inshallah. Last question by Brother Zaid. <coughs> yes. The correct understanding of this hadith is that the, the sins which are forgiven are the minor sins. Major sins, you need to make tawbah for these major sins, uh, etc. But my, it's the minor sins that, that will be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, it's, it's uh, the, the two uh, shayateen, they take the form of his parents. The two shayateen take the form of his parents. His parents don't come out of the grave. There's, uh, there's another narration, uh, but I'm not going to mention it because I'm not sure of its authenticity. But um, the shayateen, they take the form of his parents. One takes the form of his mom, one takes the form of his, his dad, and then they order him to uh, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll just check uh, again, just bear with me. The devils that are accompanying him will take the form of his parents and after resembling his parents, they will say to him, O child, believe in him and follow him. He is your Lord. The Bedouin will be deceived and forced into believing him. This is in Ibn Majah. So they'll take the form of his parents. They won't actually enter his parents and then uh, the life, because his parents' bodies are probably decayed, etc. So, uh, you know, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that can raise the dead. Allah knows best.